Chapter 3 Despair and Hope The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Henry David Thoreau On one occasion, it is said that Henry Matisse asked concerning the renowned Spanish artist Picasso, What is Pablo doing? Jealous of his reputation as the foremost painter in Paris, Matisse asked this question as far back as 1906. And what Pablo was doing continued to influence and often to dominate art for the next 60 years. Again and again, his shocking innovations set the pace for other painters. In the last half century, there have been more styles of painting than in the previous 2,000 years. Picasso played a part in many of them. His work could easily fill a museum or illustrate a history of modern art with paintings, sculptures, drawings, graphics, and ceramics. One of his masterpieces, Guernica, is named for the small town where he lived and which was bombed during the Spanish Civil War. It is an enormous work of art, drawn in black and white. The original is in the Museum of Modern Art in the city of New York. And there are many copies in many parts of the world, including the Picasso Museum of Barcelona. I had the opportunity to see Guernica there. The painting depicts houses, human beings, and animals as fragmented and destroyed. It is a painting of fragments and darkness. Obviously, as with the majority of Picasso's works, one has to receive the message in relation to one's own personal perspective. From differing viewpoints, there are several titles which could be appropriate for the work of art, such as the impossibility of, hu of a human being saving himself or herself, the tragedy of war, brokenness and destru destruction, or perhaps in a deeper sense, how to face dark despair. The important thing is to find in the painting the fact that he is asking a very important question and, at the same time, is challenging the tragedy of war as well as depicting the despairing condition of our situation as human beings. He is asking, who shall free me? Picasso has also painted something of the dualism of human life in his portrayal of the face and body of a girl, which seems to suggest the dual reality of dream and waking. In another of his paintings, a woman is looking at a mysterious other self in her mirror. Thus, the mystery and the reality of despair and hope are conveyed. On the other hand, in Three Musicians, Picasso brightens the monochrome of Cubism by adding the sense of fun and fantasy that enlivens so much of his later work and which conveys the note of hope. On the comic side, in Charles Schultz's Peanuts, we find Lucy saying, Do you think that life has any meaning when you have failed nine spelling tests in a row, and your teacher hates you? Obviously, this experience for a young girl would indeed be a cause for despair. Two human emotions, hope and despair, represent the two beats of the human heart. All of life is a series of experiences of hope and despair, despair and hope, hope and despair. It is like a pendulum which oscillates constantly along the journey of every human being. Harry Emerson Fosdick, in The Living of These Days, described his experience of doubt and despair in a way that many of us resonate at some time or another. The harder I struggled, the worse I was. It was what I did, it was the struggling with that was sick, 
I, who had thought of myself strong, found myself beaten, unable to cope, not only with outward circumstances, but even with myself. In that experience, I learned some things about religion that theological seminaries do not teach. I learned to pray, and because I had adequately argued out prayer's rationality, not because I had adequately argued out prayer's rationality, but because I desperately needed help from a power greater than my own, I learned that God, much more than a theological proposition, is an immensely, immediately available resource that just as around our bodies is a physical universe from which we draw all of our physical energy, so around our spirits is a spiritual presence and living communion with whom we can find sustaining strength. Sometimes we find that it is the nature of our mood to concentrate on the negative, to magnify the problem, even to discount the good we see and qualify it with. Yes, but, for example, beautiful day. Yes, but no rain. Or when people talk behind your back, they're likely to say, fine person, but. Or, of course I believe in God, but. We tend to highlight the negative, and some And today, some people are bringing that negative, despairing mood into the church to an alarming degree. There is a such thing as the sin of despair, which is the result of hopelessness and melancholy. Tristesi. In one of his books, The Mediator, Emil Brunner helps us to understand the meaning of what he identifies as confident despair. The state of the Christian is one of confident despair, but this despair is confident. All these inner moods and feelings, as they rise and fall, toss like the waves of the sea river, the sea over, and a movable sheet of rock, upon which these words are clearly inscribed. I belong to Christ in spite of everything, in spite of myself, in spite of my moods and feelings, in spite of all my experience of my own impotence, even in the sphere of faith. I belong to Christ, not because I believe in him, but because of what Christ has said through the word which God has spoken to me in him, the mediator. Despair is caused by many things. Sometimes it is the unanswerable questions of life, especially the problem of pain and suffering regardless of its specific manifestation. Sometimes it is the uncertainty about the future which fills us with anxiety. It is impossible to have certitude during our earthly life. Uncertainty is obviously an integral part of our own finite nature. It can be said that only certainty that we can have in life is the reality of uncertainty. Sooner or later, the moment arrives in which we must learn to live in the midst of the uncertainties of life and walk by faith into the future unafraid. This translation of a popular Spanish corrito says it well. I know nothing about the future. I am unaware of all what will happen. But I know that I have a friend, and Jesus will save me. Frequently, women experience the meaning of despair very deeply. As Betty Friedan writes in The Feminine Mystique, Sometimes a woman would tell me that the feeling gets so strong She runs out of the house and walks through the streets. Or she stays inside her home and cries. Or her children tell her a joke and she doesn't laugh because she doesn't hear it. I talked to women who had spent years on the analyst's couch working out their 
adjustment to the feminine role. They're blocks to fulfillment as a wife and mother. But the desperate tone in these women's voices and the look in their eyes was the same as the tone and the look of other women who were sure they had no problem, even though they did have a strange feeling of desperation. A man who was preparing to commit suicide by jumping off the George Washington Bridge in New York City. There was nothing the police could say that would dissuade him. They got a priest to talk to him, but the priest did not change the man's mind either. Then, an onlooker volunteered to climb up and talk with him. There seemed to be nothing to lose by accepting the suggestion, so the police let him climb up through the girders, and after a little while, the two came down together. When they asked the volunteer how he had done it, all he could say was that he had told the man that he too had once thought of jumping off a bridge. He had shared with the man the story of his own boy, who was born with a serious heart defect, and what agony it was for a father to have to watch him grow and be unable to play, do the things other children do, never knowing when that ticker would quit altogether. He told about how the doctors had perfected the open-heart surgical technique and that the boy was going to the Mayo Clinic to have an operation which might work. Then he closed by saying, I felt for the guy. He's got troubles. I've got them too. But a person has to stay with it. When we think of this story, we realize that life is all in the fearful hoping, sorrows, joys, and maybes in between. A person's got to stay with it. Frequently, we live in a condition of in between. We're always between success and failure, between enthusiasm and boredom, between despair and hope, hope and despair, despair and hope. The truth is, we need to keep alive the dialect between hope and despair. It is precisely as a result of this dialectic tension that we are able to go beyond hope and despair. There are moments in the life of every human being when all hopes seem to have died like the leaves of the tree in autumn. Sometimes it is impossible to hide the sadness that is in the depths of our souls. Despair is like a tragedy, a tragic captivity that sometimes leads us very close to the abyss, and only a miracle can keep us from falling into it. Despair is agony, the agony of not finding a solution to our dilemma, of wandering, wandering with uncertainty about the world. Cervantes who was held captive in Algiers early in his life, was always hoping for liberation. He believed that if there were enchanters that mistreated Don Quixote, there were also enchanters that would defend him. It was with that conviction that Cervantes was able to find the star of hope shining with a soft light in the far horizon. Just as light shines brighter in the midst of darkness, so hope may stand firmer in the midst of of struggle and agony. Sir Walter Scott in The Lady of the Lake wrote, Hope is brightest when it dawns from fears. Sometimes hope comes about as the tolling of the bells heard in the midst of the business of life, or as a small light that shines forth in the horizon when there is no other. It is in the midst of misfortune that the character and endurance of a person are manifested. We know that life is both triumph and tragedy. Tragedy and triumph. The memorable words from the Broadway musical 
Fiddler on the Roof, are appropriate to life when they tell of one season following another, laden with happiness and tears. It is clear that in our paths there will be light and darkness, day and night, mountaintops and valleys, idealism and realism, optimism and pessimism, yes and no. Understanding this fact also helps us to comprehend the ambiguity of human life. The secret lies in being able to understand this is the way life is, and we cannot change it, but we can instead find creative ways of facing the ambiguities of our existence. It is important to cultivate a spirit of celebration in spite of those ambiguities. Just as our Lord and the disciples sang a hymn and then went out to guess the mine. Therefore, we also should sing the hymn and then go out to the place where we need to make bitter decisions and experience profound sorrows. We go out to guess Gethsemane and then we return again to sing a hymn anew. This is the meaning of worship and involvement in the world. Many human beings are possessed by a spirit of sadness, an attitude of melancholy, and a chronic mental depression. They no longer know how to laugh, much less experience the true joy of living. It is clear that sadness is an experience of self-destruction. It is important to dislodge it and get rid of that intolerable burden of melancholy. Sometimes it is caused by adversity, brokenness, pain, and despair. In all these experiences of anguish, the risen Christ comes with a profound question. In the spirit of compassion, Jesus asks, Why are you weeping? Regardless of the reason for our sadness, Jesus is able to empower us with joy. Sometimes hope comes into our lives in the midst of the storms of life when there is not a single light on the horizon. It is in the midst of our misfortune and mystery that the real spiritual strength is manifested and we are enabled to see beyond the dark, the dawn, and thee, as stated in the Hymn of Hope by Earl Marlott. During the beautiful first Easter morning, we find Mary Magdalene in the Garden of Despair, looking for the Master and not being able to find Him. Then suddenly, she is able to recognize the risen Christ. That same Garden of Despair is transformed into the Garden of Hope. Mary's encounter with Christ is gives her the strength to overcome her despair and to rejoice in the hope of her own resurrection. It is then that she has the motivation to run and share the good news with all the disciples. The truth is that there are men and women everywhere who live in despair. Many of them live in a sort of quiet and silent desperation. They are possessed by a case of spiritual anemia. It is important to believe not only in the resurrection of Christ, but also in the potential resurrection of men and women here and now as they go from a condition of despair to a condition of hope. Expectation makes life good. For an expectation, we can accept our whole present and find joy not only in its joy, but also in its sorrow. Happiness, not only its happiness, in its happiness, but also in its pain. To go from despair to hope is an existence experience in which a person is able to say yes to life. Tournier wrote that when you say yes to life, then you go from a negative attitude to an attitude of adventure. True hope is not based in what other persons may or may not do, 
or in favorable or unfavorable circumstances, but in a God of hope who has the power to break the chains of slavery. The Apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, talks about all kinds of trying situations that cause despair, affliction, perplexity, persecution, tribulation, defeat, and being struck down. He sends the message of a hope that overcomes all of these. He talks about the victory that can be obtained in spite of difficult circumstances. When we realize that we are not abandoned or destroyed, in the case of perplexity, the apostle emphasizes that we are never to despair. In all of these, he sends the message of hope. The way to counteract these conditions is to tell of the power of not being crushed when troubled, (gasps) though badly hurt, never destroyed, but especially even if sometimes in doubt, never in despair. The answer of God to the human dilemma of despair is that it is not necessary to continue in our pilgrimage sad and discouraged. The victory already is ours. It was the great author Ernest Hemingway in The Old Man and the Sea who wrote, Man is not made for defeat. A man can be destroyed, but not defeated. The concept of hope is misunderstood by many persons. It is not a superficial promise of the future, a pie in the sky, by and by. Nor is it some vague and abstract conception that things will improve on their own automatically sooner or later. Good luck or bad, being born under a good or bad star, and fatalism that projects a philosophical theory or predeterminism are not part of this concept. Rather, hope is something that emerges right from despair. Paradoxically as it sounds, like a way that is open in the midst of the wilderness, in the midst of despair, we are able to find the flow of hope. It is the antidote of despair. And as the Scottish author Robert Louis Stevenson said in El Dorado, from Virginibus Purisque, that it is better to travel hopefully than it is to arrive. Emil Brunner was indeed correct when he asserted, in eternal hope, what oxygen is for the lungs. Such is hope for the meaning of human life. Take oxygen away, and death occurs through suffocation. Take hope away, and humanity is constricted through lack of breath. Despair supervenes, spelling the paralysis of intellectual and spiritual powers by a feeling of the senselessness and purposelessness of existence. Therefore, hope means the presence of the future, the future and the potential, vividly present and actual to us. Hope is an expression of liberation from despair as God's answer to the human question is seen. It is a flickering flame nourished by the oil of the grace of God, because it is a hope founded upon the God of hope. To hope means to set out on an adventure, as did Don Quixote, knowing that the struggle against the giants is inevitable, and the victory is uncertain. Nevertheless, it is necessary to begin one more struggle and continue it even against an unbeatable foe. It is important when everything else has been lost 
to keep alive the purifying fire of hope. Let everything be lost, because we still have the stars. United States Senator Edward Kennedy brought a black audience to its feet in a campaign address during the 1980 presidential campaign, referring to the countless difficulties of his political campaign. He concluded with the words of Curtis Burrell's old song, I don't feel no ways tired. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy. I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. Despair and hope, hope and despair, despair and hope. Life is like that, but thanks be to our Lord, hope has the last word. Think about these things. Have you had recent experiences where you have felt close to despair? What were the causes? What did you do about those causes? Are there persons you know who need desperately to talk to someone who would understand their quiet sense of despair? Could you initiate this kind of dialogue with them? What does it mean to live and walk with hope and to radiate hope? Are there persons you know who have this kind of attitude? Do you have this attitude? Pray aloud. Oh God, there are times when I have felt very close to despair. If I should ever come to that point, help me so that it will be confident despair. I am open for hope to emerge within my heart and life. Let me learn the secret of walking with hope day by day. Amen. A thought for reflection. We have hope. Tienemos Esperanza by Frederico J. Pagora. Because Christ came to enter in our journey, because he broke the silence of our sorrow, because he filled the whole world with his glory, and came to light the darkness of our morrow. Because he came as stranger poor and lowly, because he lived proclaiming love and healing, because he opened hearts of hungry people, and brought new life to all who would receive it. And hope we are forever celebrating, with courage in our struggle we are waiting, in trust and reassurance we are claiming the future in my land. In hope we are forever celebrating, with courage in our struggles we are waiting, in trust and reassurance we are claiming. This is our song. Because he dealt with all the angry merchants, and he declared the evil of their doings, because he lifted every child and woman, and put aside the proud and hateful people, because he bore a cross for all our sorrow, and knew our every weakness and temptation, because he took the pain of condemnation, and then he died for every kind of person, because his triumph came one early morning, and he defeated death in fear and sorrow, because he moves triumphant to the future, to bring a kingdom saving all tomorrow, because he lights the path of all the children, and with his fire he brings to life new meaning, because his light is a fountain for our witness. We know he'll lead us all into his kingdom.